I'm still at La Ferme des Cartes d'Etampe in Hemingford, Quebec. This is Jean Martin Fortier's uh, new, though it's not really that new, farming project. It's actually in its fourth year, in its third year of production. And uh, to be honest, it's been hard to make videos here because this, this whole five days has been so jam packed. And uh, we, we run the, we're, you know, we're present eight to five, 8 a.m. to 5, so there's a lot going on. It's been hard to make videos, but right now I want to make a video. It's going to be relatively quick. Unfortunately, JM has got a lot of things to do because he's running between uh, delegating to his crew and then he's got obligations in the class. So he's he's really busy, and I hope I can get one more video in, in with him, but we'll see. But in this one, I want to just talk about some of the things that they've tried on this farm and some of the things that are new and speak to them, and this is part of, these are gonna be part of some of the questions that you guys asked, and I do hope to have another video where I, we ask JM those questions directly or some of those ones, but I can speak to some of them because he's a good friend of mine and I know what's going on at this farm and I've heard the updates myself. So, the first thing I wanna show you is this farm has a series of hedgerows, and they are, basically they act as windbreaks and also sort of areas for wildlife, birds, bugs, um, snakes even, and uh, they're great, they're beautiful, uh, but the original, the idea with them is to create enough natural ecology on the farm that uh, this would provide beneficial insects, increase the bird habitat, so that you won't need, you won't have pests essentially. Now, I think the principal idea of this is coming from permaculture, and I think some of it is a little bit ideolog uh, ideological, which, you know, sometimes is not rooted in, ev in evidence. But that's okay. I can tell you from first-hand experience that being on this farm, I hear more bird life and I see more natural habitat on any other farm I've been to. So that says a lot about bringing the ecology here. Now, the, the real question is, are these hedgerows reducing the amount of pest pressure they have on the farm? From what I can see, they're not, but it's only four years, so it, it's possible that it could. However, there's insect netting everywhere, right? And that's an organic farm's number one pest prevention is insect netting, and they're still using a lot of it here. So hedgerows are awesome. There's no doubt that they're bringing habitat into the farm, but so far, I haven't seen any way that they can measure that success because they're still using insect netting but I can hear a lot of birds and it's absolutely beautiful and there's no doubt that they work as a windbreak so there's a function there and uh, that is certainly easy to observe. So let's go on to the next thing. Okay, a ton of planning went into the design of this farm and uh, there's so much natural ecology on it, it's beautiful. And the way they have sort of managed the water runoff from the farm is really, really smart. I can't tell you I wouldn't be able to explain this in the same way that perhaps some of the original designers did. JM worked with a, a number of permaculture designers on here and so there's a lot of these sort of rudimentary principles and they're really more about the landscaping application than they are the agricultural ap application because, you know, we've still got 30 inch beds, we've got blocks of 10 beds, 100 feet long. And so most of the, the permaculture stuff that's in practice here is in respects to water runoff and landscaping and uh, you know perennial type things, systems that are around it. But they have this natural wetland here and it's not only totally beautiful, but it also actually, it serves a purpose. And the way they've designed the uh, farm is to have water make its way down into these. And these act as sort of a filter. They kind of filter out probably maybe the, the excess nitrogen that might run off. I don't know if there's excess, but the compost, there's a lot of compost on these beds and some of the agronomists in the early stages were saying, hey, well, you know, too much compost can cause nitrogen runoff. And so their idea was to uh, mitigate that if it was a problem. And it's not, I'm not saying that it is, and I'm not sure that it is, but if it was a problem, then it would run through these wetlands. And there's more of these. There's these little sort of perennial areas around the farm that have these and this one's really cool because there's this there's this pond here there's another pond over there that has a a, a little dock and uh, my wife and daughter have been swimming in it while I've been teaching it <laughs> kind of jealous looks amazing um, but this is really cool and again it's nothing I can say 
that it has a practical application in the agriculture. I think it's really more about uh, creating natural beauty and also inviting habitat and, and, and filtering water, but it doesn't necessarily have an agricultural application. And the thing with this farm, and some people ask, like, why are the beds running downhill? You know, one thing people often assume is uh, if they come from sort of permaculture is that everything should be swaled and they're terraced. But this is a wet climate here. They get a lot of rain and there's not, they don't even really need to have permanent irrigation set up on all these blocks because it gets rain so often. And so they actually want to run the beds down. And so the uh, north end of the property is the top of the slope and then it all makes its way down. And so when they're starting production on this farm, in the field, the first beds they plant are the ones up top because they're the most high and dry, whereas the ones down below, which we'll go see in a minute, they're low and wet. So those ones are the last ones to be planted during the season. Of course, the greenhouses and all that are the, the first things to be planted. And then the field production, they start on the top with caterpillar tunnels, and then they make their way down the farm as they progress through the season. It's a big farm and there's a lot of stuff going on here. One thing that I don't know if I've mentioned in previous videos, at this farm is that it is a, what I call, and a few other people call a stacked enterprise. There's more than one enterprise on this farm. There's the vegetable farm, which is what Jean Martin and his crew run. There's a pastured poultry um, chicken operation on the farm, which is managed by another person. There's a, a pig operation where they're doing uh, Pigs in the forest, it's really cool. Um, and then there's actually some cattle here as well. So there's a lot of dimensions to this farm. But Jean Martin runs the vegetable farm, so I can't really speak to the other parts of this enterprise, but it is cool that you have a enterprise that's diverse. And I think on a practical sense, it makes sense to have different people manage the different aspects and then that's their specialty. It becomes really really complicated and difficult to manage a farm that has so many facets if you don't have sort of specialized people managing those and speaking of stacked enterprise they added another one this year this is the beginning of the flower market garden at Les Fermes des Quatre Temps and this is actually going to be managed by an individual who understands this operation and it's their specialty. So this isn't something that JM is going to oversee. This is entirely an operation independently run by that person but operated and, and marketed under the brand of FQT, Le Ferme de Quatre Temps. And um, I can't say a ton about it, but it's got 30 inch beds. They look like they're 50 feet long and uh, it's on drip. We've got all kinds of flowers going on in here and I don't really know anything about flowers so I can't really comment too much on it but it looks familiar I've seen flower farms before it looks very familiar to that they've got some landscape fabric keep the weeds down even employing a small caterpillar tunnel with some early stuff and from what I have been told about this is that this year on this farm is basically on the on the flower farm is to just kind of get it established and work out some kinks they're not really expecting much from production. I mean, I think they're selling some of these flowers, but they're not expecting much from it. Next year, they're gonna have a whole other wing of the farm that is this. They're gonna have, like they have a fresh sheet for their vegetables and meats and stuff like that. And they're gonna have a flower sheet, which is where customers who just want this will engage them and order product from there. So it's uh, something that's, that's in development, but it's another facet of this farm that is, um, really cool this is a new addition to the farm as well but i'm sure it was part of the original plan they just didn't have these up and and uh fully functioning until this season in fact they might have had them going by last fall but they're relatively new at least as far as me being here this is a series of five i think these are 20 yeah these are 24 by 100 foot unheated high tunnels and um it's bringing a lot of extra production for the farm. What's really cool about what's happening in here is that they're already on their second and third successions of some of their summer crops. So they start nightshades like eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes, and then, not a nightshade, but cucumbers in the, over here, the heated tunnels. 
and they get really early production in there. If you guys saw the second last video I did on the farm here, you saw like massive tomato production already going on peppers and all that stuff. Now in these tunnels, they're on, and, and then so, well, let me back up. <laughs> they start the earliest stuff in the gutter connected uh, three part hoop house, and then they do second successions in the other heated hoop houses. And then in here, they've got third succession. So I see a third succession of eggplants, a third succession of tomatoes, um, a third succession of peppers. They've got a tunnel that's full of patty pan squash. I don't think they do those in the heated tunnels. They don't actually. So they've got patty pans and zucchinis in this one tunnel, tomatoes. And then on the last one, they've actually got, they're doing watermelons in there, believe it or not. And a lot of people will say, well, why the hell would they do that? That's a, that's a very low value crop and it is. But they run a sort of um, executive CSA program on this farm. It's really expensive, it's $25,000. And so it's basically people who are benefactors of the farm, they're sort of, uh, sort of phil philanthropic um, for them. Uh, but they get year round stuff, um, obviously not a CSA share for everybody but it's for these 25 people who are essentially the um, funders of this farm or, or a big part of the funding on this farm. And so they'll do things like that for their members. They're not growing watermelons to sell at farmer's market. It's more that uh, the members of their CSA can get a very broad selection of produce and meats and eggs and things like that. So it's part of that, but uh, it's an interesting way to grow watermelons. I can't say that I've seen it done this way before. I mean, I'm sure as far as the density and uh, all that, the way they're planted is nothing new. I just never seen them in a tunnel and uh, they're actually relatively tight. I've done watermelons in the past too and I, I hadn't done them in 30 inch beds like this. It looks like they're two, maybe three feet apart and then they've got insect netting over this. And so, you know, you still see a lot of insect netting on this farm. So despite all of the ecological things that they've installed here, the ponds, the hedgerows, the surrounding areas that are full of perennials, they still need insect netting. And I think it's important to recognize that there, and I actually wrote an article about this. If you go to my Medium blog, I wrote a, a, an article about sort of the five myths in permaculture. Something that JM and I agree on is uh, there's a lot of ideology in the space and where that ideology meets practicality is often a very gray area and uh, it has yet to be seen if a lot of this stuff works for sure. Um, you know, they had, uh, I've, I'm, I'm planning to talk to JM about it, but we'll see. It's, it's hard to uh, find time to do these things. I'm here early in the morning doing this video before our class starts. But uh, a lot of people are asking about the compost tea here on the farm. They had Elaine Ingham here. And uh, from what I can tell, talking to the people in the crew, talking to JM, you know, they put all this money and time into compost tea and they didn't, they didn't notice any results. And they're still fertilizing their crops with compost and um, chicken manure and alfalfa, things like that, like they always have. And that compost tea hasn't created a, uh, a system where they don't need to fertilize and they don't have pests. And I think it's important. I think it's important to look at things in an evidence-based way. If you're going to use these things, that's great. But do they actually work? And I mean, the nice thing about this farm is that they have a pretty much endless budget because of the funding behind it, which is awesome. So they can experiment with those things and actually track and measure the results. So maybe at some point, JM will write a book about all this. I hope he does, I think he will. Um, I don't know how he'll find the time, but he'll have to. But uh, they've done so many experiments here. I'm just really scratching the surface of what I'm showing you guys. But um, yeah, that's all I have today. Uh, like I said, hopefully, I can have jam for a sit down and talk more about the things and the experiments that have happened here, what's worked and what hasn't. So if you guys like that, please hit the subscribe button right now. Hit that notifications button next to it. Like and share the videos with your friends and I'll talk to you guys later. Mm -hmm.